Good evening and welcome to this program of Radboud Reflect and Radboud University and also in part the political science department of Radboud University. Um, my name is Chile Tempels, I'm program manager for Radboud Reflect um, and tonight it's a tremendous honor for us to welcome into our midst Professor Theda Scotchpole. Um, some of you political scientists, sociologists might al already have heard about her but she's one of the most renowned scholars in the field of political science and sociology. She studied the big questions of our time. You can think about social evolutions, the rise of the welfare state, and even and more recently, uh, the rise of political protest movements in the United States. So for instance, the Tea Party she will be talking about this evening, maybe also uh, the opposement uh, to the Trump administration. <clears throat> so that's what she will be talking about tonight. But on Thursday, she will also be receiving an honorary doctorate by the Radboud University. So that's the main reason why she's here, but we're very honored to also have her here tonight for you um, to listen to. So, so. <laughs> the outline for the evening is pretty straightforward. Um, in about one minute, Professor Theodore Scotchpool will be starting her lecture on resistance in American politics. Um, and she will be focusing on the Tea Party as well as the rise to the anti-Trump resistance. So who are these people getting out on the streets? Why are they going there? And what does this mean for the state of American democracy? And what can we learn from this? After her lecture, which will, will be about 45 minutes, she will be interviewed by political theorist and political historian Gaert Ketz from the political science department of this university. Um, after the interview, there will also be room for some questions from you from the audience. Um, I wish you all a very insightful evening, and without further ado, I would like to give the floor to Professor Scotchpool. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you. It's a, it's a delight to be here, and um, I'm make sure I understand. Where do I see? Oh, there, okay. <laughs> See what I'm talking about, all right. So um, the full title of my remarks tonight reflects the fact that I'm gonna be comparing two widespread citizen movements. And when I say widespread, I mean all over the United States that have emerged just eight years apart at what is a very unusual juncture in American politics. American, America is not a parliamentary democracy. It is a divided powers uh, democracy. And that means that it's fairly rare for a president to be elected at the same time as the House of Representatives and a Senate of the same party. And yet, that rare event happened in 2008 when Barack Obama was elected along with Democrats in both houses of Congress, and it happened again in 2016 when a very different president, Donald Trump, was elected uh, along with uh, re-elected uh, houses of Congress of, of the Republican Party. And in both cases, there was an eruption of citizen activism on the opposite side of the political spectrum. And um, these two quotes come from some field research and interviews that my colleagues and I have done the first comes from a Tea Party couple uh, that uh, Vanessa Williamson, my co-author in the work on the Tea Party, interviewed in Arizona. And you can see what they say. We always um, were busy people, but we voted. And then we realized that we had to be more active citizens. Uh, and we do Tea Party stuff. I'll talk to you about what that means to take our country back to where we think it should be. Notice the very similar sentiment from uh, a w an older woman in Wisconsin that I interviewed in the anti-Trump grassroots resistance that erupted after Donald Trump's election eight years later. I had always been uh, a voter, donated to my party, et cetera. She was an active citizen. Then the presidential campaign became more and more ridiculous and frightening. 
and the worst, our worst nightmare happened. My night, my life changed overnight. I was called to action. I, I feel like a soldier in a war trying to take back the country, my children's future, the climate, and it just keeps, and the list just keeps growing. The anti-Trump resistance woman is a little wordier, but she's saying very much the same thing as the Tea Party activists. Uh, something has happened in national politics that makes us realize we've got to do it, not the politicians, and we've got to take our country back to where we think it should be. So what I'm going to do tonight is offer some research-based findings that compare these widespread voluntary upsurges at very similar junctures in American politics. I'll talk a little bit about the emergence and scope of Tea Parties and later the grassroots anti-Trump resistance groups who participated, why they got involved, um, talk a little bit about the battle over health care, over Obamacare, uh, which has was central during the early struggles of both of these movements, uh, and say a little bit about how top-down and bottom-up forces relate in them, but especially how they've affected the Republican Party on the right and the Democratic Party on the left. So that's where I'm headed. The research that I'll be drawing on are, are three uh, different kinds of things. Um, my colleagues and I have uh, looked at the um, incidents of indivisible connected and other grassroots resistance groups that have spread across four states especially, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, and North Carolina, but in special depth through the state of Pennsylvania, which is a good one because it's got 67 counties. It's a huge state. It includes all the different areas that you would expect to find across the United States, or urban areas, suburban areas, and very conservative rural regions. And as it happens, be able to compare uh, what we've found about these contemporary grassroots resistance groups. In some cases, we've visited them, we've observed them, we've interviewed their leaders and members. We've used online questionnaires to, 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 to um, uh, gather information systematically about from leaders and members of these groups. Uh, and we're in a position to compare that to some of our findings, particularly about the groups that were organized and where, as well as what we observed in interviews uh, in 2009 to 2012 with grassroots, uh, very conservative Tea Party activists in the United States. So uh, just to uh, remind you, um, and I think I'm going to stand so I can see a little bit better what you're seeing. Um, the Tea Party erupted within weeks after Barack Obama's inauguration in January of 2009. And one of the uh, key events was the appearance of a financial commentator, Rick Santelli, on uh, CNBC, calling on uh, conservative Americans to protest mortgage assistance policies, of all things, by dressing up as colonial Americans and uh, throwing tea bags into the harbor. That particular thing kind of fell by the wayside for various reasons, but the a call to protest was heard by people all over the country uh, of a conservative band who were quite depressed after Republicans lost that election and the first African-American president was inaugurated. Fox News and right-wing media in the United States kind of joined the cheerleading for these events and told people tips on how to, how to go to regional uh, demonstrations, uh, st starting especially on the day in which taxes are due in the United States, mid-April of 2009. And here's some of the research that shows that close to half a million protesters, maybe even as many as 800,000, protested in 542 counties across the entire United States. And most of these demonstrations were older white Americans dressed up in colonial costumes and carrying signs denouncing Barack Obama as a fascist or a communist. I mean, they didn't seem to make a lot of distinctions there. <laughs> um, now, 
more interesting even than the initial protests were the fact that over the course of the next year and a half to two years, some 900, and we now think retrospectively probably more than 1,000, regularly meeting local tea parties were formed voluntarily by conservative-minded men and women in localities all across the United States. This map was put together in the spring of 2011, and we went back and looked again and found two-thirds of the groups still active in 2012. The lighter areas have fewer tea parties per million people. The darker states have uh, the, the greatest density, uh, according to our research. And the little circles are for very large online memberships claimed by those tea parties. Uh, those tea parties were not created by the Koch brothers. They were not created by any wealthy uh, elites. They were created by ordinary middle class men and women who um, found a meeting place in a church or a library or a restaurant and collected dues or sold par paraphernalia like uh, tea Party Pins Made in China or Sarah Palin Biographies uh, to raise uh, small amounts of money. And, and they were uh, very active in, in sort of educating grassroots citizens and helping them to lobby uh, at all levels of government. Now, just to flash forward on, uh, to the early Trump era, um, a huge protest was mounted the day after. In a way, the anti-Trump resistance got going even faster, um, perhaps because electronic media was more, uh, was speedier. Uh, back in the Tea Party, people used things like Meetup, but they used Facebook to start organizing and within days after the anti-Trump, uh, the Trump was elected in November. Of, it was also the case that the Trump election was a shock to liberal Americans. Actually, it was a shock to all Americans, and I, it probably was a shock to Donald Trump himself. So <laughs> it was just a shock, and uh, whereas most people had expected Obama to be elected. So the day after um, uh, Trump's inauguration, as I think we uh, all know, there was a huge demonstration, Women's March, in Washington, D.C., but uh, my colleagues and I perked up when we saw how many women's marches were held all over the United States. And there was, this wasn't just a bunch of liberals gathering in San Francisco or Washington and New York or Boston. Uh, there were uh, marches even in um, Idaho uh, and, and uh, all over the South, all over the country, just as extensively and, in fact, many more people than those initial Tea Party uh, protests that I described before. Uh, within, even before the women's marches happened, uh, some uh, congressional staffers got together and created a, a Google Doc that was called the Indivisible Guide. And it looked back at the Tea Party experience of organizing local tea parties and pressing uh, congressional Republicans and Democrats in the Obama era and offered tips to people who were upset about Trump and the Republicans to imitate those tactics by our, in the anti-Trump uh, grassroots groups. And that was important because liberal Americans in recent times have been used to contacting the White House. You know, when they want something done, they, they, they would try to look to the national uh, leadership. But there wasn't any national leadership for any liberals to look to uh, after November 20, 2008. So the guide was important, and it, it, was, it spread like lightning on the Internet because it told people you could organize a local group and go to your local congressional office or, or do demonstrations in your local area. And so that helped to inspire the formation of a huge number of local groups. The Indivisible organization created an interactive map, and um, both in early 2017 and, and later periods, our, our researchers have downloaded all of the listings by zip code. And this is a map that shows, I think now, but it's very similar to back in 2017, the listings. Uh, about maybe a third, a little over a third, are actual meeting groups. These were people who put their their information on this interactive map so that if people went to it, they could find them. It, this map is useful because it gives you some idea of where the density per population is, uh, once again. And you can see they're all over the place. Um, 
My research colleagues and I have dug even deeper in some key states. Above all, the key state of Pennsylvania, which has 67 counties, and we have a, what we believe to be a complete list of 225 grassroots groups that were organized and met face-to-face, -face, as well as interacting online, at some point between 2016 and early 2019. We're doing the same thing for the state of North Carolina, which is this, at the bottom, even though it's a smaller state, these maps are a little off scale, but they're meant to give you an idea of where there were tea parties. Those are red, tea parties only, those counties. North Carolina has 100 counties. Uh, where there were resistance groups only, that would be now, or after 2016, that's blue. But look at all the purple, which indicates just how many counties in both of these states had both types of groups at one point or another. And the point you should take away from this is that even though in the United States, liberal Democratic voters tend to be clustered in big cities, and conservative Republican voters are everywhere else. These two movements are equally everywhere. The white areas that had neither are either so rural that there's hardly anybody to organize anything, Pennsylvania, or so rural or predominantly African American in North Carolina. African Americans organized through their churches not in the kinds of groups that I'm going to be talking about today. So um, let me talk a little bit about how these groups formed. In both cases, uh, my colleagues and I have been visiting eight counties, two apiece in North Carolina, Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, and Ohio, to get to know local leaders, Democrats, Republicans, business people, church people, uh, police chiefs, um, my husband Bill helped to drive me around thousands of miles the first time around. He lets me go by myself uh, subsequently. Uh, but I've actually gotten to meet people across that entire spectrum following the rules of research. So I don't tell one person that I've talked to the other unless I have their permission, although by the time I leave these smaller places, they all know who I've talked to. Uh, still, I follow the research rules. And we discovered on our first visits in the spring of 2017 to places that all voted for Donald Trump, either very rural town-centered counties in each state or medium-sized cities, all voted for Trump. We found anti-Trump citizens resistance groups in all those places. That's when I first realized that something equally widespread was happening um, in the early Trump era. And we had the chance to attend some of the meetings to see what they were like, just like Vanessa Williamson and I attended Tea Party meetings uh, a, a decade earlier and saw what they were like. Uh, we also, I've also had the chance to interview these leaders of these groups repeatedly and to follow up with them in online questionnaires and with their members. So that's where a lot of our data comes from. But to make sure that we weren't just looking in conservative areas, we've also used online questionnaires and online searches and, inter and interpersonal networks to discover the 225 groups across 55 out of the 67 counties in Pennsylvania and have gotten answers from uh, online questionnaires for most of them to give us uh, evidence about big city areas, suburbs, as well as the medium-sized cities and the rural areas. So that's the evidence we're using. Now, what we found is that the resistance to Trump, um, the people who led it, usually teams of two to four women, sometimes an, a man in there, none of these groups exclude men. The men present are usually the partners or husbands of the women. Uh, but it's usually a leadership of two to four people who found it, each other, sometimes through Facebook, um, Pantsuit Nation Facebook, local contact mechanisms that were put in place right after the November uh, uh, 2016 election to allow people to kvetch or grieve together. And then they turned to organizing within days in many cases. Then they would use their contacts to, to put out a call for people to hold a founding meeting, maybe in the, a restaurant or a library, 
And from then on, those groups were up and running by 2017. Um, a lot of the groups took some ideas from that online indivisible guide about what they could do uh, to, f to resist the Republican agenda in Washington or to resist President Trump, but they also had a lot of their own ideas. Um, we um, found that a lot of, our fa uh, of what happened in this uh, anti-Trump resistance was very, very similar to what happened uh, uh, in the early Tea Party era. These are some of the anti-Trump resistance groups. You can see the kinds of people in these pictures, which I just love. You can see uh, Central North Carolina in a library, uh, the basement of a liberal church in uh, Ohio, uh, uh, some kind of uh, meeting room in western Wisconsin with a doctor leading the meeting. Uh, and we found through our questionnaires as well as observations that in the grassroots anti-Trump resistance, between two-thirds and 90 percent of the participants are women. They are overwhelmingly older women. The median age is 55, although there are some young mothers with children that participate in leading and uh, and the activities of anti-Trump resistance groups, whereas tea parties, when we visited them before, uh, the only children present would be some very unhappy grandchildren. Uh -huh. uh, so uh, those were also older whites. Uh, but 80 to 90 percent of the leaders of anti-Trump resistance are college educated, often with advanced professional degrees of one kind or another. And they tend to be teachers, adjunct professors, health care professionals of one kind or another, uh, business women, sometimes uh, lead, small businesses, uh, or nonprofit managers. That's who is leading the anti-Trump resistance. And we find exactly the same patterns in conservative and moderate areas as we find in big city liberal areas. There are no demographic differences and no... Uh, racial differences. Um, nine of the 10, out of 10, people who answered our questionnaires. Now, answering the questionnaires means you put in the effort. So these are very active people. They're not the couch potatoes who are just kind of checking in to Facebook every now and again. Uh, they're not necessarily representative of everybody who sympathizes with the anti-Trump resistance and maybe would go to an occasional community event. But the very active people say that they are Democrats or that they lean that way. Others, though, will say that they are independents or disgruntled Republicans. Tea Partiers back then were also older white Americans. Uh, more evenly balanced between men and women. In fact, married couples arriving in large cars with a lot of uh, Tea Party bumper stickers were the typical attendees at Tea Party meetings. But they, too, often met in the back rooms of restaurants or in where they would buy dinner and then get the room to use or in a library, the only difference is that tea parties often move toward meeting in large churches, um, evangelical uh, conservative churches, and their meetings start with a prayer and the Pledge of Allegiance, then and now. There are still some tea parties meeting. Um, uh, any Trump resistance meetings are sort of more like a let's just get down to business uh, secular uh, citizen event. Um, but uh, the uh, Tea Partiers were also older. They were middle class. Their occupations were more likely to be things like construction business owner, um, middle managers, um, contractors of various kinds, and retired military and their wives. So it's an occupational difference, not so much a class difference. Uh, we always saw women in these meetings, and they were often the ones doing the actual work. <laughs> what else is surprising? <laughs> yeah. 
So uh, in our questionnaires for the anti-Trump resistance, we asked people, why did you get involved? And this figure uh, gives, in the blue bars, is the percent of 436 respondents, which is what we had across those eight counties and across Pennsylvania, who gave that type of reason. And then we let people have up to four reasons coded from their open-ended answers. So you can also see the percent of all the reasons that were given. And, you know, opposition to Trump is obviously big. One man just answered the question, Trump, Trump out, you know, as his reason for joining. But most of the people who answered our questionnaires also talked about reviving American democracy, building a stronger, more active, citizen-centered democracy. And you can see that those reasons are pretty close uh, in number to the opposition to Trump. Partisan reasons, like electing Democrats, were not the main reason given in 2017. Uh, the need to act personally, which we saw in those opening quotes, and increasingly important over time, I, I see this in my repeat visits to these areas, is finding community, uh, getting to know other people, building friendships. A lot of the people who founded these groups didn't actually know one another until they met on a bus to a women's march or... Um, through the first meetings of their group. And that was true in the Tea Party, too. Um, Tea Party organizers often did not know each other before. And that was a big research question for us in both cases, because you might assume, well, what happens when a controversial president is elected? Groups that already exist just change their names, and they become the Tea Party or the anti-Trump resistance. And a little of that happens. But these are newly formed citizen voluntary groups in both cases, overwhelmingly. So that's an important finding. Now, the person of the controversial president that was elected at these junctures is symbolically and emotionally extremely important to these widespread citizen movements. It's uh, Obama and Trump uh, frightened the daylights out of people at the opposite ends of the political spectrum, but for very different reasons. For Tea Partiers, and I say this based not just on national survey evidence, but really just listening to people in face-to-face -face interviews, um, found Barack Obama to be terrifying because he symbolized un-Americanness. I think his black skin was part of it, but actually I don't think it was as important as his foreign father and the fact that he seemed like an immigrant type or somebody that catered to immigrants. Now... He also was a perfect storm of fear for Tea Partiers because he was a Democrat, he was urban, and he was a professor. And professors are a very bad category in Tea Party land. Uh, and one of the things we might want to talk about in the discussion is how a Harvard professor managed to meet some of these people and interview them. And the answer is, I show respect, which surprises uh, the people that I interview. To resistors, Donald Trump is horrifying because he is seen as lacking character and qualifications to be president of the United States, because he represents a sense of disrespect and hatred toward women, minorities, and immigrants, and a selfish disregard for the public good. You see that coming out in the current impeachment fight, that that's the one that seems to have caught a certain amount of public uh, attention. Um, so what do these groups do very quickly? Not so different. They tended to meet once a month in both cases, face-to-face, uh, -face, uh, but also have an online presence. Uh, uh, Tea Party groups usually were somewhat ritualized in their meetings. They would start with the Pledge of Allegiance and a prayer, if the, particularly if always a Pledge of Allegiance, usually a prayer. Um, there were some Jewish members of tea parties, and some of them objected to Christian prayers. So uh, that could be a touchy issue. But a lot of Christian right people are, were in the tea parties, and for them the prayer was fine. And of course, if they met in a church, usually that was part of the requirement. Uh, but then they would listen to usually an outside lecture, uh, perhaps a visitor to talk about gun rights or the horrors of the global warming uh, uh, regulations 
And then uh, the group would um, uh, decide on groups that were going to go to the local town council to object to things like bike paths or go to the state legislature or go to Congress if they were near Washington. And I have to say that Vanessa and I were very, very impressed when we interviewed Tea Party people in Virginia, Arizona, and New England at how much they understood the political process in great detail. They had really educated themselves and they understood not just electoral politics but actual legislative politics in great, uh, in very, in great enough detail that they could act on it. Uh, re resistance groups are very similar in that regard. These uh, groups are schools of citizenship. They teach Americans about the complexities of their gerrymandered districts. They teach them uh, how to register voters in the case of the resistance groups, which do a lot more of that than Tea Parties ever did back then. Uh, and um, in both cases, these sets of groups spent the first year, in many cases, protesting either the enactment of Obamacare the health care law under Obama or trying to save Obamacare during the first year of the Trump presidency when the Republicans in Washington were trying to repeal it. The reason that resistance groups are more likely to engage in voter registration activities and get out the vote activities is that they were thinking about increasing the vote for Democrats in populations including um, lower income and minority populations in their areas that might not automatically vote. Whereas Tea Partiers could take for granted that all, all their older white neighbors were going to vote pretty regularly. Um, the other difference that we've seen is that resistance groups are more willing to ally with neighboring groups like unions or the National Association of Colored People to hold joint events. Whereas Tea Parties, in our experience, were very, very persnickety about any outside influence at all. Just very, very stubborn and autonomous, uh, and didn't even like to necessarily work with other Tea Parties. These are some of the pictures that indicate the long-running battles of over health reform that both sets of groups engaged in. Tea Partiers at the top, resistors in Buffalo, New York at the bottom. Uh, and the groups that I visited in these eight counties, here are some of the things they did to try to educate their neighbors about what was in the Obamacare law, help to shift public opinion about it in its favor, and help defend it uh, uh, in Congress. Um, there were street demonstrations, for example, in Hazleton, Pennsylvania. There were pro-life-themed um, die-ins in central North Carolina, where many of their neighbors would be pro-life. Uh, and so they were trying to make the case that health care is pro-life. I mean, you know, it's, it's sort of obvious. but um, And then uh, regular visits to congressional offices in the local districts. Most groups sent delegations once a week. And whereas Tea Partiers in the past would appear and yell at Democrats, Resistors are much more likely to arrive, and this is a Republican representative's office in mid-Ohio. He, of course, never wavered from voting to get rid of Obamacare, but the protesters would arrive once a week with cupcakes uh, for the staff, and perhaps persuaded some staff members. You wouldn't be surprised. And then there was a Valentine's Day have a heart demonstration in North Carolina. Uh, in both cases, it, I think, these grassroots movements played a role in the period after 2010 and shifting aggregate national opinion sort of against Obamacare overall, and then in the first year of the Trump presidency, actually in making Obamacare more popular than President Trump himself. Uh, I'll just say a, a few other things before I wrap up. Um, In both cases, these were widespread grassroots citizens' movements, but they also had national parts to them. And I think a lot of social scientists who study social movements mainly focus on the national actors, the ones who are on television in the United States, at least. I don't know how it is in the Netherlands, 
or the ones that are organizing in the nation's capital. And of course, those existed in both the Tea Party world and uh, the resistance. In the Tea Party world, there were things like Americans for Prosperity, a Coke-backed uh, uh, wealthy advocacy group. Um, uh, there were um, various kind of Tea Party Patriots, which was set up to sort of aim to try to coordinate local Tea Parties, uh, and groups that um, tried to orchestrate big demonstrations in regions and in the nation's capital, and would often send out buses to bus people in to those demonstrations. Um, these were professionally run groups of the kind that Washington, D.C. has by the zillions, they were uh, very adept at um, lobbying Congress and at putting themselves on television, and they invariably claimed that they controlled the grassroots Tea Party. We discovered in our research that no such thing was true, uh, that the national groups were putting themselves on television to say that all these popular Tea Partiers wanted to get rid of our social security system and our public spending on uh, Medicare for the elderly, our research, plus national surveys eventually showed grassroots Tea Partiers, the ones that were organizing in those local groups, were all on Social Security and Medicare and military veterans' benefits, or were about to be. They thought they were fine. They thought ordinary Americans had worked a whole lifetime to earn those things. They were against Obamacare because they thought it would go to people who hadn't earned it. But they felt very good about their own extremely expensive uh, social insurance programs. And uh, we found in our interviews, and it was later backed up in national surveys, that the number one issue for t grassroots Tea Partiers was opposition to immigration. And that was true no matter whether they lived in parts of the country that had any immigrants or not. Because in part, they watched anti-immigrant and racial rhetoric all day, every day on Fox News. Question seven in our interview uh, for grassroots Tea Partiers was, where do you get your news? And I remember the man who looked up at me across the table in the Comfort Inn and smiled and said, not where you do. <laughs> He's right. Uh, but if you watched Fox News, you would see things on there that a few days later were in grassroots Tea Party or rhetoric, even though they bore no relationship to any truth. And much of them were about stoking fear of immigration, particularly immigrants, uh, Hispanic immigrants. Um, some similar tensions between top-down and bottom-up exist in today's anti-Trump resistance. This is not news that uh, most center-left uh, people in the United States like to hear. But the national advocacy groups that are busy signing petitions with each other and telling Nancy Pelosi that she's betraying the country if she doesn't impeach Donald Trump quickly enough, that went on for months, or if they don't close down the government over, I don't know, whatever the leftist issue of the day is, uh, they claim to represent grassroots Tea Party, or, uh, grassroots resistors, but when our interviews happened and our questionnaires and just keeping track of what the local groups are talking about through Facebook, we don't find anything like that kind of far-left orthodoxy. The truth is that people who participate in grassroots resistance groups are a mix of leftist-leaning progressives and Democrats, moderate-minded people, and some who aren't even Democrats at all, but just are horrified. And it depends very much on the local area, what the mix is. But a lot of the local groups are just as reluctant to take orders from the Washington, D.C.-based groups as the Tea Party groups were back then. And in fact, what local groups did in both movements is to pick and choose what they'll take from all of the offerings that are being given to them. In the Tea Party, national groups would offer bus rides. They would offer small grants to help form a website. They would offer speakers, since speakers were what most Tea Party meetings were organized around. In the case of the anti-Trump resistance, the national and regional groups are usually offering training. These are higher educated people who believe that training is the key to everything, uh, something that I can sympathize with as a professor. And so they offer training, but the local groups pick and choose what they will take, and they often will take whatever they want from different sources, 
and they don't take orders about what they're supposed to do. So these are truly citizen voluntary movements uh, that think for themselves. Now, by 2018, just like it was true back by 2010, voting and running for office was stressed in the case of the 2018 through the women's-led resistance groups, and a record number of women ran for office in uh, 2018 across the United States, and a lot of them were women who were generated from these various resistance groups and were backed by them. But so were many male Democratic candidates uh, backed by these groups. We asked the groups across Pennsylvania to report on their election activities during 2018. We got back reports from 82 grassroots groups in 49 of the 67 Pennsylvania counties. And I just want you to notice the large number of activities that were reported. Many groups reported three or four or five to seven activities. But the most common activity, knocking on doors, is not, um, it's not an inexpensive kind of activity. It requires people to devote Saturday after Saturday, that's usually how it would operate over many months, to learn how to talk to people in their communities that in many conservative areas could be kind of frightening to knock on their doors, um, and to really work at it over a long period of time. So it's not the cheapest kinds of activities that most of these groups were engaged in, but by the dozens and then sometimes the hundreds, they would go out weekend after weekend uh, to try to make the case, first just to talk to their neighbors about what issues mattered, and later to make the case for uh, Democratic candidates running for office, for local offices, for state legislative offices, and for congressional offices. Both the Tea Party and the grassroots resistance generated surges in candidacies in their immediate aftermath. The red line is the peak that the Tea Party, um, that accompanied the Tea Party surges in 2010, and the even higher uh, blue line is the peak that came in 2018. Um, record numbers of Democrats and women, female Democrats, won in 2018 at most levels in the first election after Donald Trump's victory in the Electoral College. And let me just say that a final piece of our research is to think about what is going to be, what has been and will be, the impact on governing agendas and party structures and activities of these grassroots citizens' movements. In both cases, they were partisans mainly conservatives who voted Republican in the Tea Party surge, mainly Democrats who vote Democrat in the anti-Trump surge. But these movements were not organized by the political parties themselves. That's an important distinction. They organized outside of them, and in the case of the Tea Party, were very suspicious of institutional Republicans at the time. They were opposed to Democrats and Obama, but they were also very fiercely opposed to any Republicans who were willing to compromise with Democrats and President Obama. And they usually organized outside the Republican parties in their states and localities, and over time gradually took over most of those parties. In two out of the eight counties I'm visiting, there are still Tea Parties meeting today, which is remarkable, and I've met their leaders. Uh, but in most of the areas, they've simply moved into the Republican Party and largely control it at the state and local level. Resistors are uh, also organized outside the Democratic Party virtually everywhere by choice. Even in cases where Democratic Party women's groups helped to hold the first meeting, which happened in some places, the groups usually decided to adopt their own name and to organize outside the party because they wanted to attract um, people who didn't feel comfortable calling themselves Democrats, either because they thought they were more progressive than Democrats or because they were more moderate. Uh, depends on the area. And, but over time, over the course of 2018 in particular, and this is something we've asked people about in questionnaires and tracked very carefully, in most areas that we know about, and certainly all across Pennsylvania, 
the women who've organized these outside resistance groups have gradually been running for local party committee offices. They've been taking over, uh, in some cases completely taking over, uh, local Democratic parties. In other cases, joining older party regulars like trade union guys, and, you know, they argue. Uh, but they're coming to terms with one another. More to the point, and the research that we've done and some of my students have done on the ground, shows that candidates running for office on the Democratic tickets uh, often were more interested in having volunteer help from these outside resistance groups than, than from the local parties themselves, particularly the local parties that weren't very good at contacting voters or engaging in canvassing. So what we're seeing is a gradual process of transformation of the revitalization of citizen engagement with the grassroots of the Democratic Party, which was really significant because in many parts of the United States, the Democratic Party didn't have very active grassroots. In the cities, because urban machines were in control, in the not urban areas, because there's just not enough Democrats to interest the national consultants. That was not true during the Obama presidential campaigns. Obama was pretty good at organizing right down to the neighborhood level, but his efforts were allowed to atrophy and were not incorporated into the Democratic Party itself. And one of our big research questions in this work is to see whether these grassroots groups that have emerged will keep at it through 2020 and beyond, but also whether they will transform and revitalize citizen engagement in many places with the Democratic Party. So let me just conclude by saying, what next? There are a lot of open questions. Um, some answers I'll, her, I'll, uh, are, I'll suggest. I don't think they're, the Tea Party has taken over uh, much of the grassroots of the Republican Party. Um, there's new data out from Pew Research that shows that the most pro-Trump Republicans, ordinary Republicans, we're not talking about wealthy elites, we're talking about ordinary people, are people who sympathized with and participated in the Tea Party. Uh, and I was glad to see that research, but it told me what I already knew uh, from talking to Tea Partiers. Uh, Tea Party Republicans are thrilled. Um, business Republicans will say, I wish you would stop tweeting as much. <laughs> Tea Party Republicans say, I love the tweets. I want the wall. I like it that he's kicking ass with liberals. And that's what he, they love about him. Um, he expresses the resentment that grassroots Tea Partiers feel about a changing America that is no longer as white, as Christian, as built around traditional family norms as they would like. And Trump sells nostalgia and resentment in a way that is powerfully appealing to these folks. So Tea Party Republicans are very predominant now in most Republican parties across the country. They are the core of Trump's support and they're not going anywhere. They will turn out in droves in 2020. It's an open question though, whether the local left to center anti-Trump resistance groups led by women in so many places will push the Democratic Party as far to the left as the Tea Party groups and the wealthy um, millionaires and billionaires that in the Koch network that I haven't talked about tonight have pushed the Republican Party to the right. I don't think so because I think the spectrum of people's views in the anti-Trump resistance is broader, but this is an ongoing process and we don't know. We don't know yet how volunteer citizen activists will relate to Democrats that they help to elect, although the signs are that in places where Democrats were elected with a lot of volunteer canvassing, they have continued to meet regularly with their constituents in local areas. Um, and uh, we have to see whether the impeachment struggle and the Democratic presidential nominating contest, which is a sort of an unending circus so far, will draw all the attention to the national level and to the fights over uh, left versus right in the Democratic Party. There's really no right, but, you know, I'm, it's relative. Um, or whether these grassroots groups will continue to feel that their activities are really vital going into 2020. I can assure you that they are vital. 
The grassroots anti-Trump resistance is part of a civil war that's ongoing in the middle class in the United States. You know, you, you'll hear a lot about how it's black versus white, immigrant versus non-immigrant, and all those things are in play. But really, it's a civil war inside white middle class America about what America means. Is America a confident, immigrant, welcoming, tolerant, public-spirited nation? That's what the anti-Trump resistance wants it to be and is trying to help it be more fully. Or is it a frightened, wall-building, uh, inward-turning, uh, white Christian nation? That's the fight that's going on. It's a fight that really has high stakes for the future of US democracy. And I guess given America's ability to throw its power around across the world, particularly when it feels threatened, it's a battle with very high stakes for everyone in the world. So let me stop there. So come and sit down, huh? All right. So thanks, Professor Scotchpo, for this uh, fascinating talk and a surprising talk, I must say, on, on the comparisons between these two, um, these two movements. Um, being trained in, in history myself, and I know that you are, you've been studying history a lot as well. You have your particular historical comparative approach. I want to start with a, with a, a historical question, maybe. So maybe to get more of the context of this, um, this phenomenon, these phenomena, could you try to draw us the history of this kind of self-organizing um, grassroots in the US? Um, is this a typical American phenomenon? Uh, is it part of US political culture, would you say? Mm -hmm. OK, I think in some ways it is. Now, um, my colleagues and I did work on the history of American voluntary movements uh, in a book, Diminished Democracy, that was published. And what we did there was to try to identify all of the voluntarily organized associations uh, that had emerged uh, and enrolled uh, as voluntary members 1% or more of Americans sometime between 1790 and, um, I guess it was about 1990, was the end point at that, in that project. And what we discovered in that research, we, did, we identified 60-some of those, not including churches, per se, mm -hmm. or political parties, was that the typical form of voluntary organization was not just a bunch of local groups of, of the kind that some academics suggest, but local groups that met regularly face-to-face -face and were linked to mm -hmm. state and local uh, action. And, and yet that form of organizing appeared to go into decline after 1960 with the proliferation of professionally run, nationally focused advocacy groups on the right and left, but especially on the left. Um, and I think what's interesting about these two electorally sparked widespread movements is that although they're not at all exactly the same as those classic three-tiered federated voluntary associations, they have some similarities uh, in that they're grounded in face-to-face -face activities in many localities that are linked into regional, state, and national uh, political and civic activities. Mm -hmm. So in a way, it's a revival of a very old theme. And certainly the answers that I showed you in those questionnaires where people said, I realize we've got to do it. Uh, you know, We've got to become more active. That's almost like uh, Americans on both sides of the spectrum remembering something and Americans always knew. And I don't think it's completely absent in Europe. I think Norway has a lot of it, for example, and the Netherlands has a fair amount. But it's not, it is pretty distinctively American, and even if it's not politically correct anymore, <laughs> to suggest that there are distinctively American things, but I think they really are. Um, and this is one of them. Yes. yes. So, so maybe you brought in the comparison with Europe, and of course, apart from your historical research, you're also famous for your comparative research. So maybe to draw into that, 
how does this compare to movements, grassroots movements that we see in Europe uh, mm -hmm. nowadays? One concept that I felt maybe was missing in your, in your presentation just now and also in the, the chapter that you wrote is the concept of populism, mm -hmm. which would tie these two movements maybe in Europe and in, in America together. So could you say something on that? What is the role of populism in this? And would you be able to compare this kind of populist grassroots movements to populist movements in Europe? Well, I'll say a couple things, even though I haven't done the kind of detailed comparative research that I actually think is needed to make uh, precise statements. Um, first of all, the term populism is one I find overly mushy. Um, I do, there are a lot of people in the United States, at least, in the United States social scientists, who want to believe that, uh, for example, popular movements on both sides are really angry about economic inequality on Wall Street. Mm. I have never heard a grassroots conservative person criticizing Wall Street. Mm. I'm so sorry mm. to report that. Uh, but that never comes up. They criticize the politicians that they think may do things to, for Wall Street but it's the politicians they hate. So I don't believe that the economic inequalities play the same role. And there's been a lot of debate among, about whether the, 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 the pro-Trump popular roots are mainly about displaced factory workers mm. or people angry about economic displacement. And I think that where the evidence is coming out fits what I see in the ground when I visit these places, that it's often in areas that have experienced economic decline over quite a long period of time, but certainly not recently. It's, I mean, those factories are gone in Pennsylvania a long time ago. Mm -hmm. uh, but the memory of what life was like is still there for some of the older people who, who respond to... Um, a message from Trump that they know isn't even true. I mean, they know he's not bringing back the coal mines. They know he's not bringing back the factories, and they'll tell you that. Mm. But they like it that he, you know, invokes that. However, the real balance of evidence is that it is resentment of immigrants, both symbolic and actual. And the most pro-Trump areas of Pennsylvania are areas where immigrants have moved in and are taking very different kinds of jobs and are profoundly resented. Um, uh, when, when immigrants are between 5 and 25 percent of the population, they really are perfect targets for politicians hmm. who want to stir up fear and anger. And I think that also exists in Europe. But it plays out differently if it's a parliamentary system and there are multiple parties. What has happened in the United States is that this ethno-nationalist populism has been one of two major prongs of radicalization taking over one of two mm -hmm. major political parties. And Donald Trump was elected with ethno-nationalist support. He's retaining all of it. But he also was elected by a lot of regular Republicans, Main Street, pro-business type Republicans, who voted for him because he was a Republican uh, and didn't realize, in some cases, the degree to which he was not quite what they expected. So part of what happened in 2018 uh, was that a lot of highly educated suburban women in particular, and some working class women, decided they'd had enough of the constant hatred mm -hmm. that's being spewed. And I guess I think that the reason for that is women are sensitive to social order and social and tolerance. They have to send their children to school. And if uh, kids are imitating the president by yelling at other kids, um, that makes women uncomfortable. So they're the first to get off that mm. particular bandwagon, and I don't think it's economic-driven. I think it's driven by this sense of whether this is appropriate behavior for a president at the most visceral yeah. level, but also visions of what the country is about. So that, that hints in the direction of some kind of the, 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 um, the comparison with right-wing populism, uh, ethno-nationalism in Europe. What about the left wing? So would you say that the part of the resistance movement, for example, is, is that a, a populist movement, and does it, does it have a... 
Well, you know, there are a lot of, I mean, the people who are at the core of the anti-Trump resistance are fairly privileged women. Now, mm. when I say fairly privileged, a teacher in mid-Pennsylvania is not making a lot of money. Uh, so, uh, but they have a respected occupation. Uh, so I think status terms come in here. Um, uh, however, they are likely to be concerned about rising economic inequality. It is a mistake to think that people simply vote their economic interests. I come from Cambridge, Massachusetts. It's full of people who are voting to raise their own taxes. Hmm. We really are. We want our taxes to be raised. Um, and a lot of Trump supporters are um, fairly well-to-do, too. I really mean it when I say this is a fight inside the American mm. middle class. And most of the people doing the active fighting in the sense of organizing these groups that are ongoing groups, not just voters in general, but they are not the down and out. Uh, now, you could say, well, so what, Vita? Who cares? What we really care is the broader swaths of the population. And so I guess I'll make the pitch, which is a methodological pitch in part, that the study of politics and the study of social movements needs to look at ongoing organized action. I'm a historical institutional political scientist, and I believe the shape of the institutions of government matters, so the federated structure of American politics is different from nationally centralized political systems. It rewards different kinds of movement activity. But it's also the case that organized formations that can persist across elections, that can engage people, that can shape conversations in public, they matter above and beyond simply the individuals that you could add up that are part of them. Hmm. So what, what interested me maybe the most about your lecture is that all of this political self-education that these activists do uh, occurs deliberately outside of the major parties. For the most part. Yeah. So Except they move into the parties if they can. Yeah. And they pick and choose the kind of education programs that the parties offer. I think traditionally this kind of political ed education has been uh, done by the, yeah. by the parties. In, Not in the United States. Ah, no, okay. No, 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 no. okay. I mean, in Europe, yes. Uh, so, you know, European parties often do have community roots and education. American parties are often just catch-alls, and mm. they often activate just during election periods. Now, I think we're in a period in the United States where things are becoming more ideological, but the carriers of that ideology are these outside movements. As they begin to move into the parties, they will sometimes um, try to talk about ideas more mm. and, and talk about ongoing activities in between elections. But that's... You might say it's a Europeanization of American political parties, but that's probably overdoing it. <laughs> um, meanwhile, many political parties in Europe are Americanizing and oh. you know, hiring consultants. You know, yeah. And stuff. Yeah. yeah. So let's try to um, to bring this into a more normative uh, sphere, if you like. Um, the title of your talk was Saving America once again, and it's become clear that these groups conceive of, the, of themselves as aiming to save American democracy or the American uh, state or the American people. Um, so, Mike, and, and of course, there you can think, think of reasons. They're diametrically opposed in their view yeah, of, of what course. they're saving. Yeah. Of course. Um, so you, you explained in the very beginning of your talk that, that America is a demo democracy of separation of powers. We know that the Founding Fathers tried to avoid the kind of faction and the kind of polarization that we maybe see occurring now. Um, so what should be our take on these kind of movements? Is this, is this in, indeed the salvation of American politics, of people actually doing politics themselves on the streets, knocking doors? Or is it the, the demise, the downfall of American politics because of the polarization that it's, it's bringing? Well, I'm not going to choose. Uh. I mean, uh, you know, um, one of the most poignant moments in the Tea Party research that we did, it was very unusual for academics to go out and talk to grassroots Tea Partiers. Um, and that was a real change in my career because I'm a macro-historical social scientist. I had never gone out and actually interviewed face-to-face 
uh, people whose poli personal political views I find uh, loathsome. Um, I always have to take a Tylenol when I went back to work <laughs> at the end of the day after the interviews. And that's still true. Uh, but the key to doing the interviews, even getting them, was to show some respect for the fact that these were self-organized citizens. And that wasn't fake on my part. I actually think it is. Uh, somebody asked when we, when we would come back to Harvard after these interviews, large crowds would come to hear our talks, and it was as if we were returning from a foreign tribe um, uh, and reporting on something that you know just was outside the understanding of most people in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And I remember Jane's Ma Jane Mansbridge asking about an hour and a half into a two-hour discussion once, well, is it a good thing that they're more active citizens or not? And I had just reported the one striking thing that uh, Vanessa and I had seen, that the Tea Party people we talked to had completely crazy ideas about the content of American public policy. They believed things that were not only not true, but you couldn't hardly believe people with their education level believed those things, because they weren't uneducated. And yet they knew how the workings of government in much more detail than anybody in, Ma in Cambridge, Massachusetts, mm. who just thought, who knew all about the public policies, but would just contact Washington, you know, and had no idea what was going on in the state legislature or the city government. So I guess my answer was it's both. I mean, obviously, if people are active around hateful values, um, then that's frightening in some ways. Uh, but the fact that these were self-organized citizens who were participating and speaking up and asserting themselves against elites in their own party who didn't want them to be active struck me as a very good thing. And it's, I think the way to meet that is with more activism. And the interesting thing is that the grassroots resistance is organized in more places and more groups than the Tea Party was. Mm. That's a very striking finding. That really surprised us. And the research that we've done to document that is extremely difficult research to do. You cannot sit at a computer and call up a data set and just run some simple statistics. So that's the bad news. <laughs> the good news is that if you're willing to put in the legwork and the creativity to gather the data and to make inferences about organized groups and networks spread across the political geography, everybody wants to hear about it. <laughs> so I do think our findings are valid. I do think this new wave of activism is even more widespread. But given the polarization of American politics and given the built-in advantages the right has in the American Electoral College and the federated political system and the Senate, the left and the center have to organize much more and much more widely to have any chance at all to stop what is at heart an anti-liberal force in American politics. This brings up a question about your, the relation between your personal views, which become apparent now, and your research. And um, you've been an activist yourself. You've been active in the civil rights movements. I think you even met your husband, Bill, there. Yeah. Um, um, so at one point, you were an activist. I'm not sure if you would consider yourself an activist still, but well, how I'm would you? I'm an engaged academic. I, I, I definitely, yeah. And I write op-eds. and you know. Try to tell Democrats what to do. They don't listen, but I don't know what to do. What to do. Uh, How would you um, describe or judge the relation between being an activist and being an academic? Do you I'm very clear on the distinction. And that, um, you know, I know is not the fashion for everybody in academia anymore. Uh, but I'm going to insist on the value of a Bavarian distinction between your personal values, your citizen. What I, the way I explain it to people when I'm doing research is I am an active citizen. I have citizen views as a voter, 
and as a donor and uh, as an op-ed writer. But I do not consider that to be the same as my job as a researcher and as a classroom teacher. Mm -hmm. When I'm acting as a researcher and a classroom teacher, it is absolutely my job to report as objectively and even um, sympathetically in the sense of trying to get into the heads of uh, other people what they are about. Now, I happen to think these two things go well together. I don't think that you can be, for example, a very effective um, defender of American and Western liberal democracy, and I think there are global ideals of liberal democracy. I don't think you can be a very effective defender of those if you don't understand the roots of the, of the resentment and attacks on those ideals. And you're not going to understand them by believing stereotypes. There are a lot of people in the United States who believe that the Tea Party was the creation of the Koch brothers. Now, I've studied the Koch brothers and their network, and I have a pretty good beat on them, too. But I can tell you they used the Tea Party. They didn't create it. And if they had created it, it would be so much easier. Uh, the passions of the local activists in the Tea Party were genuine, and in many cases, they were admirable individual human beings. Most people I've met and interviewed, I've liked in some way or another, even if I thought they were saying and doing hateful things. Mm -hmm. And it's very important that I expose myself to that and report that as clearly and as objectively as possible. Wishful thinking is helpful in citizenship politics. It's fatal in research.